The content in this presentation is covered on pages 127 through 135 of your textbook, and it's meant to help you achieve learning objective number 27, which is to name and describe the 10 basic cloud types based on form and height, and to compare and contrast Nimbostratus and Cumulonimbus clouds and their associated weather. So be sure to skim pages 127 through 135 before watching this video, and also be sure to read the chapter carefully before attempting the online quizzes. This diagram's in your textbook. Uh, table 5-4 immediately below this figure on page 133 is an extremely useful list of terms used for identifying clouds. Keep your book open to this page during this section so you become familiar with the heights of the 10 main cloud types and the words I use to describe them. In 1803, uh, an English naturalist named Luke Howard published a cloud classification scheme that serves as the basis of our present uh, day system. According to Howard's system, Clouds are classified on the base of two criteria, form, what they look like, and their height, how high they are above the ground. We'll look at the basic cloud forms or shapes first, and then examine the cloud height. Clouds are classified based on how they appear when viewed from Earth's surface. Uh, that's an important thing. I'll show you one or two pictures that are um, taken from either a satellite picture or an air photo. That's not usually how we're classifying clouds, though. They look farther away, um, and the sizes are different. Um, the basic forms or shapes of cloud are cirrus, cumulus, and stratus. Cirrus or cirriform clouds are high, white, and thin. They form delicate veil-like patches or wisp-like strands, and they often have a feathery appearance. Uh, cirrus is the Latin word for curl or filament. Um, cumulus clouds, cumuliform clouds, consist of globe, uh, globular uh, cloud masses that are often described as cotton-like in appearance. Uh, normal cumulus clouds exhibit a flat base and appear uh, as though they're rising domes or towers. Cumulus in Latin means a heap or a pile. Cumulus clouds form within a layer of the atmosphere where there's some convection uh, and rising air currents. The third type, stratus or stratiform clouds, are basically appear as sheets or layers that uh, cover uh, much or all of the sky. All the clouds that we talk about are gonna have at least one of those three basic forms. Some are a combination of two of them. For example, stratocumulus clouds are mostly sheet-like structures composed of long parallel rolls or broken globular patches. In addition, the term nimbus, uh, which is Latin for, for heavy rain, is used in the name of a cloud that produces significant precipitation. So the combination of nimbo and stratus, nimbostratus, refers to a relatively flat rain cloud. And you can see in this chart, the nimbostratus is over in the bottom left. The second aspect of cloud classification, height, recognizes three distinct levels of clouds. So there are high clouds, middle clouds, and low clouds. High clouds form in the highest and coldest region of the troposphere and normally have bases well above uh, 20,000 feet. Uh, and this diagram shows you 23,000 feet. Uh, temperatures at these altitudes are usually below freezing, so the high clouds are generally composed of ice crystals or supercooled water droplets. 
Middle clouds occupy heights from uh, 6,500 to 20,000 feet, and they're composed of water droplets or ice crystals, depending on the time of year and the temperature profile of the atmosphere. Low clouds form nearer to the Earth's surface, up to an altitude of about 6,500 feet. These are generally composed of water droplets. These altitudes may vary somewhat according to the season of the year and also the latitude. For example, at high polar latitudes uh, and during cold winter months, high clouds generally occur at lower altitudes. Some clouds extend upward to span more than one height range and are called uh, clouds of vertical development. Over the next set of slides, I'm going to show you examples of the 10 internationally recognized cloud types, describe how they form, tell you about their composition, the kinds of weather they're normally associated with, and show you a few tricks for telling them apart. Uh, we'll start with the high clouds and work our way down to the bottom layer. Before we do that, I want to show you this table here at the bottom of the, of the uh, slide. Notice that um, the range of the low clouds is relatively the same. It's exactly the same, whether you're in the polar region, temperate, mid-latitudes, or tropical regions. And the middle clouds near the poles are in a much smaller range than you find them in the temperate region or the tropical region. But the difference between the temperate and the tropical region um, is not terribly different. What really is different is where the high clouds start in the polar region. They start at 10,000. You can have cirrus clouds as low as 10,000 feet. Where we live, the range is you know, anywhere from 16,500 feet up to 40,000 feet. And in the tropical region, the top, the sky, the top of, the, of the high clouds goes all the way up to 60,000 feet. This is where um, we have the thickest tro uh, tropospheric level. So the troposphere, 60,000 feet, 18 kilometers high. Uh, in places like that. Our part of the world, 12 or 13 kilometers high. Um, and further north from us, uh, in Alaska, um, you'll see it very much lower. So the family of high clouds, those above 23,000 feet, are described with the prefix zero, which means high. And they include, uh, you take to mean high, okay? Uh, in Latin, it actually means, like I said, like a, a, a filament. But we, when we see that word zero, we're going to assume that uh, we're talking about high clouds. So that includes cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus clouds. Low temperatures, small quantities of vapor uh, present at high altitudes, result in high clouds that are really thin, very bright white, and made up of, uh, primarily of ice crystals. The term cirrus means wispy or, or curly or, or you know, ref referring to hair. Um, and cirrus clouds usually appear as thin, wispy strands, uh, usually white or maybe light gray in color but they form at very high altitudes, uh, between 6,500 and 24,000 feet. The winds at those altitudes often cause these, uh, these ice trails to bend or curl. Cirrus clouds like these ones with hooked filaments are called mare's tails. Uh, these clouds are composed of ice crystals and form when water vapor undergoes deposition at high altitudes. They can most easily be identified by their fibrous, feather-like appearance, uh, and they're commonly associated with the leading edges of warm fronts, 
So they indicate the future arrival of precipitation, but they themselves only precipitate ice crystals that evaporate well before they land on the ground. So we consider these to be fair weather clouds, at least for the next day. Um, these are called the, the streaks, the precipitation that comes out of them. We can sometimes see those. Um, and that precipitation is called a fall streak. Um, and um, these also form as high altitude outflow clouds from hurricanes. And when liquid water droplets freeze in large thunderstorms. So um, we might see a jet stream powered cirrus cloud. Uh, I see that seasonally. I expect to see it again this spring sometime. Um, but a big sort of cloud show up in the sky um, as the polar front jet stream moves back up towards the north um, when we have our change of seasons. So in those times, the cirrus clouds grow. They stretch across, you know, many, many kilometers and they're, they're you know, kilometers thick. Um, sometimes, rarely, um, around here at least, cirrus clouds produce optical phenomena like sun dogs, which we'll get to later in the course. Um, maybe some sort of halo effect when there's visible light interacting with um, the ice crystals inside them. The term cirrostratus means a thin, wispy sheet in Latin. Uh, and cirrostratus clouds usually appear as a milky sheen in the sky or as a striated sheet. They form at altitudes greater than 20,000 feet. Um, they are composed of hexagonal ice crystals um, and form when warm, moist air is lifted slowly to a very high altitude or when individual cirrus clouds uh, become so extensive that they're virtually indistingu indistinguishable from one another. Cirrostratus clouds uh, can most easily be identified by the presence of a halo around the sun or the moon. Sometimes these clouds can be so thin and translucent that the halo is the only indication that they're even present and the sun or the moon will be perfectly visible through them. Don't stare at the sun, by the way. That's, that's a bad idea. They are commonly associated with uh, approaching warm fronts, just like the cirrus clouds were, especially when they get to be thicker. So during multiple sequential observations, or if they descend to become thicker, um, they might turn into altostratus clouds. Um, in those cases, usually we'll see rain uh, begin 12 to 24 hours later. The term cirrocumulus means thin, wispy heap in Latin. And cirrostratus clouds usually appear as patches of tiny heaps or puffs that do not cast any shadows on the ground. There's too high up to do that. Sometimes in rippling patterns or rows of clouds with clear areas between them. As rows of cirrocumulus uh, clouds push together and the clear uh, areas become narrower, these clouds can have the appearance of fish scales and are commonly called mackerel sky because of that fish-like look to them. They form at very high altitudes, between 20 and 40,000 feet. Um, these clouds are composed of droplets of supercooled water uh, and ice that um, form as a result of convection at very high altitudes. So you can most easily identify them by their puffy form uh, and they're distinguishable from other cumulus species by their tiny, tiny size. A common rule is that if they're smaller than the tip of your thumb, when you extend your arm and hold your thumb up, try this at home. 
Uh, remember that the rule works much better when you're looking at real clouds and not just pictures of clouds. Um, if you can fit multiple puff balls, multiple cloud units inside the width of your thumb, it means that they're very high up in the atmosphere. And you, should, uh, you would correctly call those cirrocumulus. These clouds are commonly associated with uh, instability, right? It's a convection going on, but it's happening at a very high altitude in the atmosphere. So they tell you that there's a warm layer up there somewhere, uh, an upper level inversion. Um, while these clouds don't ordinarily bring precipitation that reaches the ground, they probably do warn of an impending stormy uh, weather pattern, uh, particularly if you've noted the presence of cirrus clouds during a previous observation. This picture shows clouds at two different levels. The high clouds are those greater than 23,000 feet. Those are the cirrocumulus. And the fact that they are twisted indicates that there is wind shear at the upper level. Wind shear occurs when the upper level and lower level winds either travel in opposite directions or when the upper uh, or the upper level winds are just moving much faster than the wind in the layer below. Um, so the cloud elements, the water uh, uh, particles get or ice particles get trapped in between those layers and stretched out um, and twist all over the place as that happens. So keep in mind that these are ice crystals and a small amount of supercooled water droplets. Uh, we'll deal with the lower layer of clouds next. So that'll be the middle layer. Um, but I'm going to push pause here uh, so you'll uh, take a mandatory break. Middle clouds are clouds that form in the middle altitude range between 6,500 and 23,000 feet. They're described with the prefix alto, which means tall in Latin, but we take that to mean middle. So when you see that alto uh, prefix, think middle layer clouds. Um, there's only two in the middle layer that we worry about. One is the alto cumulus and the other is the alto stratus. Uh, alto cumulus means high heap or tall heap in Latin. And alto cumulus clouds usually appear as globular masses or rolls and layers or patches. They are larger and sometimes darker than the cirrocumulus clouds, um, but they are smaller than low level clouds. So they're smaller than a stratocumulus. They form at middle as opposed to high altitudes. Um, so between 6,500 and 20,000 feet. They are composed of water droplets, which makes them seem denser and more distinct than cirrocumulus clouds. These clouds form as a result of convection or frontal uplift and can most easily be identified by their puffy form and intermediate size. You can tell these apart from other cumulus species by their size as you measure it with your thumb. Uh, alto cumulus clouds will be somewhere close to the size of your thumb when you hold it out at arm's length. Um, they may be slightly smaller or slightly larger, but if you look at one of the larger puffs, it will not be possible to fit more than one, possibly two, uh, in the width of your thumb. Similarly, if you're looking at alto cumulus clouds, you should not be able to fit more than one or maybe two thumb widths inside of an individual puffball. They're commonly associated with uh, frontal uplift along a warm front, and they may have precipitation, but not in every case and probably not in most cases. Remember this picture? 
Okay, the uh, twisted bands of cirrocumulus clouds that we talked about just a minute ago are still up here in this picture. Um, the other clouds in the bottom right corner are alto cumulus, right? And those are in the middle level. So maybe you can start to see some difference. Those faint stripes in the background are very, very high up in the atmosphere. Um, the puff balls down here in the lower right, not so high up in the atmosphere. Um, they are composed mostly of water droplets down at this level, whereas the stripy ones up at the top are mostly ice crystals. Uh, cirrus clouds uh, over cumulus or stratus clouds is one of the key ingredients for natural cloud seeding. So in some cases, Ice crystals fall out of the cirrus clouds and into the lower deck of alto uh, cumulus. And they will act as condensation nuclei for water droplets in the clouds at the lower level. So remember that little trick as we get into the next couple of lectures about precipitation. The term altostratus means high sheet in Latin. And altostratus clouds usually appear as a uniform gray to bluish green, um, or, or, and they're a sheet or a layer. And it'll cover huge portions of the sky, if not all of the sky. They form at middle lat uh, altitudes between 6,500 and 24,000 feet. They're composed of ice crystals or water droplets or a mixture of both in some cases. Um, they form when water vapor in a stable air mass condenses as the air mass is forced to rise ahead of an approaching warm front. So they are most easily identified by the dim visible sun, dimly visible. Um, and all it has to do is be a bright spot. You, you don't have to see the edges of the, the sun to, to identify an altostratus. Um, they're generally lighter in color than nimbostratus and darker than high cirrostratus. They're commonly associated with approaching warm fronts and may thicken into a dark gray layer of nimbostratus clouds that are capable of producing plentiful rain. These altostratus clouds are somewhat thicker than the ones in the previous image. Notice that you can tell where the sun is, but only because there's a bright spot in the clouds. You could deduce that the clouds in this image are thicker than those in the previous image. These clouds look as though they may be thickening into a dark gray layer of nimbostratus clouds, which are capable of producing significant amounts of low to moderate intensity, long duration precipitation. But notice that when we're looking at alto stratus clouds, we're really not seeing uh, a halo around the sun, either in this slide or the one before it. Um, no halo forms. Uh, and that's because um, there are not as many ice crystals. Okay, low clouds. These are clouds that form in low altitude ranges, so below 6,500 feet. They don't really have their own prefix like the high clouds and the middle clouds do. But you can see that three of these four clouds have the word chunk strat in them. But remember that there are middle level altostratus uh, clouds and high level cirrostratus clouds that have that word chunk in their names too. We will focus on those three clouds in the bottom layer now. So this will be nimbostratus, stratus, and stratocumulus. Um, and we'll talk more about plain old cumulus clouds uh, when we get to the section on vertical, vertically developing clouds. So the three members that we're going to talk about now are stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. Stratus means layer, 
and a stratus cloud usually has some sort of layered appearance. But if you're looking for a flat base, um, you can sometimes be pretty frustrated. They're very low level clouds. They form well below 6,000 feet. Um, and the closer they are to the ground, the more trouble you have optically assessing exactly how close they are. So frequently they seem closer than they really are. But these clouds are, are composed of water droplets and, you know, maybe depending on the air temperature, ice crystals too. Um, but they form in a few different ways. Uh, for example, when a sheet of warm, moist air rises and cools adiabatically, uh, when the temperature of the lower atmosphere decreases and causes a, an increase in relative humidity, um, these could be formed when morning fogs lift um, or when cold air moves into a relatively warm region. You can most easily identify these clouds, the stratus clouds, uh, by their sort of blanket-like appearance. Um, relatively uniform base, it might be a little ragged. Um, and the fact that it looks like a lifted fog um, they're commonly associated with weak warm fronts. They may produce light drizzle or light snow, but I wouldn't expect them to produce very heavy precipitation. The term stratocumulus means something like sheet of heaps in Latin. And stratocumulus clouds usually appear as large, dark, rounded masses um, very often in groups or lines or waves. They form at low altitudes, uh, below 2,400 feet. So they're very close to the ground surface. These clouds are composed of water droplets and form as a result of weak convective currents. Um, those uh, currents create shallow cloud layers because of the drier, more stable air above preventing their further vertical development. So there's a barrier up at the top that prevents them from rising. They can most easily be identified as low clouds using that same old thumb test. Individual heaps should be about the size of your fist when you're outdoors, but let's just say bigger than one thumb width for your class pictures. The size of the heaps are an important diagnostic feature because stratocumulus are very similar in appearance to altocumulus clouds. When I'm having a hard time deciding, I usually go with altocumulus because stratocumulus should be low enough that there's no doubt that it's a stratocumulus. To be honest, I would be a little cautious about calling these stratocumulus based on size alone. They do, however, look very low to me, so I called them stratocumulus. They're commonly associated with warm sector. So this is an area between a warm and cold front, okay? So a warm front has just passed through and a cold front is approaching, but it's not here yet. Um, they might also be found in just a basic area of high pressure. Um, and if nothing is moving too quickly in the atmosphere, they can last there for several days. Um, if the air over the land is moist and hot enough, stratocumulus clouds may evolve into other types of cumulus clouds or they may get thick enough to produce light rain or snow all by themselves. They may be seen at either the front or the tail end of worse weather, so they may indicate storms to come if you haven't observed stormy conditions during the past day or two. These stratocumulus clouds aren't forming lines or waves, but they are certainly low level, they're large, they're dark gray masses. They're showing you another diagnostic feature of the stratocumulus cloud, the crepuscular ray. These are rays of sunlight 
that appear to radiate from the point in the sky where the sun is located. These rays um, streaming through the gaps in the clouds, particularly through stratocumulus clouds, or between you know, other objects. Um, these are columns of sunlit air separated by darker cloud shadowed regions. Uh, despite seeming to converge at a single point, the rays are actually um, nearly parallel shafts of sunlight. The, the fact that they converge up there near the top is really a perspective problem. Um, similar, for example, the way that parallel railway lines seem to converge at some point uh, on the distance, uh, at a distance. The term nimbostratus means rainy sheet in Latin, and nimbostratus clouds usually appear as thick, featureless clouds with dark bases. They form at low altitudes between, uh, below 10,000 feet. Uh, they're, uh, they're mostly composed of water droplets, and they'll form either as a warm air mass rises slowly along a front or when an altostratus cloud thickens and descends into the lower altitudes. Um, it is admittedly difficult sometimes to tell the difference between these and stratocumulus clouds. But when I see a whole sky um, covered with um, sort of a raggedy uh, looking cloud like this, um, I think nimbostratus. Um, but the dark gray color often helps you identify them. Um, and they don't really look too layered. They look like individual masses. Um, the other surefire way to, to tip you off is if there's rain, if it's raining. And I think you can even tell in this picture that it's a, it's a wet day outside. Um, they cause low visibility because of the rain. Uh, they're usually associated with warm or occluded fronts they usually produce precipitation over a wide area, not not you know just small areas like a like a cumulonimbus uh, cloud might do, but they are um, not usually associated with thunder. But you do get light to moderate precipitation from the nimbus stratus clouds that may last for days, depending on the speed of the front that's moving through. Okay, clouds of vertical development. Um, these don't fit into any of the three height categories, but instead have their bases in the low height range and extend upward into the middle or high altitudes. Um, and they're, uh, they do that because they're growing from the bottom up. They're developing vertically. And the first of these, the friendliest um, little cloud here is the, the cumulus humilis. And that means something like a humble heap in Latin. Um, these clouds appear as individual puffs, like cotton balls, amidst usually a clear sky. They form at low altitudes, below 6,000 feet, uh, they're composed of water droplets and ice crystals, depending on where uh, where they are in latitude uh, and where uh, what season it is. But like other forms of cumulus clouds, they form as a result of convection. Okay, and this is convection on a clear, sunny day. So some thermal is pushing this cloud upward. So where you see the cloud, there is an updraft. In the area next to it where you see blue sky, there's not. There's air moving laterally or there's air moving down, sinking air. Um, these are most easily identified by that cotton ball appearance. Um, and they're known as fair weather clouds because they rarely produce appreciable precipitation. The term cumulus mediocris means something like heap of moderate quality in Latin. 
um, and cumulus mediocris clouds closely resemble the cumulus humulus, except with these ones, they're starting to show signs of some vertical growth. So you can see that these are just a little bit taller. They're still in the lower atmosphere, but they're starting to look taller. Um, because they usually begin as cumulus humulus, they're most commonly found at low altitudes. Um, and similarly, they're composed of water droplets or ice crystals. And the, the convection that forms the taller clouds starts usually earlier in the day than the convection that forms humulus clouds. So if you have a warm morning, your afternoon may look more like this than the little puff ball in the um, previous image. The thermals in this case are longer lasting. They're more intense. Um, so these clouds tend to form over larger regions of the sky and have cloud covers like this one is about 50%. You'd say, you know, in some cases about half the sky um, looks like it's uh, covered by uh, clouds. So when you're making that judgment call about cloud cover, we look at the whole celestial dome or the whole sky and the whole picture. Um, and if you think 50%, about half of the sky is covered with clouds, that's a 50% cloud cover. With humulus clouds, that can be as low as 5 or 10%. Um, you can identify the mediocris by their cotton, their tall cotton ball appearance, but be careful to call them something else if they start to look like towers. Usually these are fair weather clouds, but they can develop into clouds that produce rain or snow. Um, notice here, this is a warm morning in mid June um, in the skies over Minnesota. Um, there's a humulus in the picture on the left and a mediocris uh, in the picture on the right. Both are present in the same sky. Um, in fact, that um, uh, cirrus cloud up here, this is an upper level cloud, um, is the same cloud in both cases, in both pictures. Um, so that's a sign of maybe later on in the afternoon, we're going to see more vertical development of that uh, mediocris cloud, well, of all these clouds, and, and maybe some exciting weather later on in the afternoon. And I can testify that having landed in Minnesota, that afternoon was covered uh, by cumulonimbus um, rain clouds. Cumulus congestus means uh, something like piled up heap in Latin. Um, these clouds commonly develop towering vertical domes with tops that look like a head of cauliflower. The bases of these clouds begin at altitudes below 6,000 feet, but when they grow tall enough that their tops are in the middle level, which is 6,500 feet or so, we can correctly call them cumulus congestus clouds. These are, are composed of ice crystals near the top, water droplets lower in the, the cloud, um, and even may start to have some super cooled water droplets uh, that can be fairly large in size because of the strong updrafts that are occurring inside of those clouds. So uh, the updrafts can produce precipitation they often precede the formation of cumulonimbus clouds, which are the big rain clouds. Uh, the International uh, Civil Aviation Organization classifies these as towering cumulus clouds. Um, so their symbol, their abbreviation is a TCU. Um, and I think it's a spoof on that abbreviation. Um, I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're an aviator, I think they call these turkeys uh, because of the TCU in there, and even though there's no C in Turkey. Um, anyway, um, these towering cumulus clouds should probably be treated with respect, if not completely avoided because of the strong updrafts inside them. 
In this picture, you can see a little more easily what's meant by the term towering. Uh, thermals are causing very rapid development in the vertical direction, up and down here, right? Any significant horizontal growth side to side is caused by water droplets being squeezed laterally by the immense force of the upward moving air. So this cloud uh, is growing much faster in the up-down direction than the side-to-side -side direction. It's getting tall. So this cloud might be classified as a cumulus castellanus, um, which is a specific type of a towering cumulus. Um, that's a variety that grows so quickly in the upward directions uh, that they really are dangerous for aircraft. The cumulonimbus cloud is the tallest of the vertically developing clouds, uh, reaching all the way up to the tropopause. So you can see what happens when the ice crystals near the top reach that inversion. They spread out in 360 degrees around the updrafts, uh, giving that cloud a diagnostic anvil-shaped flat top. Um, because the troposphere has different thicknesses in polar, mid-latitude, and subtropical regions, the flat surface at the top of the cloud might be anywhere between 25,000 and 6,000 feet or so, depending on where on the globe you see them. Um, this certainly isn't a polar region, so I, I have a feeling it's more like 50 or 60,000 feet um, than 24. Composed of water droplets, ice crystals, and supercooled water droplets, the water droplets are more common near the base, and the ice crystals are drafted upward to the top of the cloud, where at some point the cloud becomes 100% ice, uh, and you can call it glaciated. Because they form as water droplets, um, they are, are carried that are carried upward by powerful updrafts. Cumulonimbus clouds require significant sources of moisture. They also have to have an unstable air mass and some sort of lifting force like, like heat in order to form. So they typically go through three stages, the developing stage, the mature stage, and then a dissipation stage. Uh, this picture, you can see all three stages of development. So over to the left-hand side, I see uh, cauliflower-shaped tops, those developing clouds on the left side. Um, the anvil shape uh, is the mature, um, and um, there's even a towering castellanus kind of close to the, the cumulonimbus there. Um, but this one with the anvil, the big circular top, uh, I don't know if you guys know what an anvil is. When I was a kid, we used to watch Roadrunner cartoons, and they were always dropping anvils on each other's head. But it's a big, flat, uh, heavy, flat surface that blacksmiths used to sort of hammer um, horseshoes out on. Um, most of these storms... Um, you know, well, depending on conditions in the atmosphere, the three stages can take uh, 30 minutes to an hour to go through. Most individual storm cells die after about 20 minutes. Uh, when the precipitation causes more updraft, uh, more downdraft than updraft, um, the clouds start to dissipate. And over here to the right, I can see some areas where uh, it looks like this the this maybe used to be um, a, an anvil cloud, and now I just sort of see um, hazy, um, disassociated clouds uh, here in the background, and they're starting to look like they are um, dissipating. Um, so these clouds produce very heavy precipitation with hail, thunder, lightning, um, and occasionally tornadoes. 
Um, uh, sometimes these storm systems can remain, you know, almost stationary for extended periods of time, causing flash flooding to occur during summer months. Uh, an example uh, is the big Thompson River flood of 1976. That was the result of one of these big convective storms that uh, delivered 12 inches of rain over a time period of less than four hours in the upper part of a tributary to the South Platte River, uh, which is near uh, Greeley, Colorado. Almost 150 people downstream from the center of the storm were killed by a 20 foot high of wall of water uh, generated just by that rain. This cumulonimbus cloud is associated with a cold front that blew through Fort Stillicum, Washington last May. You can see that its top looks quite wispy and that there are other wispy cumulus, cumulonimbus clouds in a long chain that stretches off to the north. I think that the linear cloud at the base of this storm is an inflow feeder tube. Um, and that's bringing warm moist air like a vacuum cleaner hose into that storm, providing it with the energy that it needs to grow. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I've heard smarter people say similar things about clouds that look pretty much like that one. So um, show this picture to someone who knows more and see what they say. My cousin never responded to my email when I sent it to him. Um, so um, I'll keep you posted. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about some variety clouds. Um, the 10 basic cloud types can be further subdivided into varieties that are named using adjectives that describe particular cloud characteristics. The term unicus is commonly used with cirrus clouds, um, and it means hook-shaped. Um, it's usually applied to streaks of cirrus clouds that are shaped like a comma resting on its side. Um, these clouds are often precursors of bad weather. So you can see that that curving right, of those streaks is the result of wind shear in the upper atmosphere. So two air masses interacting. Um, maybe not, uh, and because they're kind of getting dense, um, they're not as friendly looking as those other ones that we were looking at before. Um, the cirrus spisatus, um, these are cirrus clouds that are actually blocking the sun. Um, so they're thick. Usually they appear uh, dark gray, like this one. Um, and uh, it can actually cause, uh, be formed by a, a lot of different circumstances, but it's particularly common um, in plumes or anvils of cumulonimbus clouds. So maybe this is a place where we've seen thunderstorms in the past, uh, in the past few hours, let's say, um, and maybe associated with a dissipation of, of a big cumulonimbus cloud. Um, depending on the wind direction from those, uh, those passing storms, um, we might see um, some precipitation uh, come up in the next you know, day or so. Um, but if there's other winds associated, we'll see an overcast sky. So if you see them uh, in, amidst a clear sky like this, um, we're talking about rain in, in you know, a day or so. When stratus or cumulus clouds uh, appear broken or fractured, the adjective fractus is used in their description. Uh, these are pieces of cumulus clouds that linger in the air after the rest of the cloud has dissipated. Um, but they may also indicate that a cumulonimbus cl or cumulus cloud is just starting to form. So it doesn't look like a cotton ball yet. Right? It's not to that cumulus phase. Um, they're ragged. Um, so either that storm, a storm has recently passed 
or we're just starting to see that convection happening. Um, if the rain is already here, like in this case, you know, it's raining, right? water's falling out of the sky. Um, sometimes we call that cloud, instead of a fractus, we call it just a scud. Um, so when any stratus or cumulus cloud appears broken or fractured, the, act, the adjective fractus can be used. Um, but sometimes um, people use the slang term scud. A common upper level accessory cloud is the Peleus cloud. Um, and um, that usually appears as sort of wispy, horizontal, lenticular crowns or caps. And the, uh, the, the term Peleus means cap in Latin. Um, and usually on some kind of a cumulus cloud. When seen attached to a cumulus congestus cloud, like this one, uh, it indicates that there are strong updrafts uh, within the cloud that may help transform it uh, into a cumulonimbus. Another accessory to cumulonimbus clouds is the mammatus cloud. Um, these clouds appear to hang from the base of, cumulon of cumulus clouds, uh, most commonly cumulonimbus clouds, um, and they have developed, uh, those cumulonimbus clouds have developed into particularly severe storms. So um, there are a number of theories about how they form, but we do know that they are uh, associated with the most severe of thunderstorms. Um, Probably sufficient to say, because there's a lot of disagreement over how they, how, over the different theories of their formation, but it's probably sufficient to say um, they appear to be clouds forming by localized bursting downdrafts that are bringing warm, moist air into a cooler layer below the cloud. Um, you aviators will want nothing to do with these, these, uh, with this sort of sky. Um, a very turbulent uh, atmosphere. The last cloud to talk about today is uh, the Alta Cumulus Lenticularis. It's a lenticular cloud, and we are really lucky in our region to get to see these a few times a year. Um, they are stationary lens-shaped clouds um, that are common, which is to say not so terribly rare, uh, in regions like ours with rugged or mountainous topography. So although they, uh, they develop whenever the airflow develops a wavy pattern, they most frequently form on the downwind or leeward side of the mountains. Um, as moist, stable air passes over the mountain, a series of standing waves on the downwind side form. So as the air ascends the wave crest, it cools adiabatically. And if the air reaches its dew point temperature, moisture in the air condenses to form a lenticular cloud. As the moist air moves down into the trough of the wave, the cloud droplets evaporate, leaving areas with descending air cloud free. So the air is moving in this picture from the right to the left. Um, the air molecule, the air kind of blows up here across the liquid uh, condensation level. That's the point where the dew point temperature has been reached. And any moisture in the air turns into a liquid form. So here is that cloud forming, uh, moving uh, as the particles move from the right side to the left side of the screen. I put in these dashed white lines to indicate the, that's another good way to tell which way the wind is blowing. Okay, use the content provided on the Canvas site as well as any links that are, are on these slides um, uh, or any other, other, other you know, qualified internet sources. 
um, to be sure that you can formulate answers to these questions. If you can comfortably answer them, you're in great shape for the next uh, exam. If you can't, review the textbook, rewatch the video, and see if your abilities improve. If you're still completely stumped, start a, a discussion on the Canvas site or ask me for help.